Hello there. Nicola Sturgeon always knew what the Supreme Court outcome would be. It's actually just another rung on her ladder to freedom fighter status. Now, if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe and then like and comment below. I must say, if you thought Nicola Sturgeon has just wasted money on trying to force her Indy Ref 2 to happen next October, then I would say that in her view it's probably money well spent. She is now another step up the ladder towards standing on the plinth of victimhood and to claiming she is some sort of freedom fighter. You only needed to hear her talking at her post-court decision press conference to see that. In her view, the court has just voted against Scottish democracy, Westminster is against Scottish democracy, the UK is against Scottish democracy, etc, etc, etc. The overbearing UK denying the rights of Scotland. And that was always the plan because it was always clear that the Supreme Court had to rule against Holyrood having the power to hold its own referendum, given the clarity of the law on the issue. Hence the unanimous decision of the five Supreme Court judges. Even Scotland's own top law officer, the Lord Advocate Dorothy Bain KC, said that she could not allow a referendum bill to be proposed in Holyrood without the court's say-so. But now the SNP leader, Nicola Sturgeon, has laid out her next and very expected path of progress towards independence. She has ruled out acting unlawfully by conducting a wildcat referendum, which would have been boycotted by unionists and failed anyway. So has declared that she will commence a massive independence drive and make the next general election in Scotland a vote purely on independence for Scotland. It will be a de facto independence referendum, she said. She wants so many votes that it will force the UK government to concede. Scottish democracy will not be denied, Sturgeon stated. Very Citizen Smith, very tooting popular front. But what of the democratic once-in-a-generation referendum in 2014? Was that not democracy too? Or just the wrong answer? And what if she loses a future referendum? A new leader re-cranking the machine again? Just like when Alex Salmon stood aside to allow a new leader to restart the clock after 2014? Sadly, all we can expect to come out of the SNP over the next couple of years is destructive and divisive rhetoric. And the worst of it is that she and her party will continue to neglect their core job of working for the people of Scotland by allowing, or worse, facilitating, the decline of Scottish education and healthcare, as well as their drug death problem. But then blaming Westminster for it all. The Westminster that has just promised Scotland another 1.5 billion quid in Barnet consequentials. And in Parliament today, the SNP were given the opportunity to ask far more questions during PMQs than fairness among parties usually allows. Now the question I want answering is, will democracy in Scotland allow regions that vote against independence in any future referendum to remain in the UK? And we already know the Scottish Government would exclude Scots living outside of Scotland to have a say in that referendum, while at the same time the likes of famous celebs who do not live in Scotland are put forward by the Nationalists as a sort of spokespeople for the independence campaign. Celebs who love Scotland so much they decide to avoid it. How democratic is all of that? Now the Tories keep telling the tax, borrow and spend opposition that you can't tax your way to growth. But that is exactly what two members of Liz Truss's ex-cabinet are now telling Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt. Kit Morthouse and Wendy Morton both say that growth is the only way we're going to get out of this recession and that hammering small businesses to squeeze them dry won't cut it. 
and they won't be the only ones saying it. But apart from some vague comments about the UK being the new Silicon Valley and putting money into research and development, all I can see is a future of decline and decay under a Rishi Sunak government. The trouble is that anyone associated with the extremely short-lived trust tenure has now been comprehensively discredited and condemned, whether that's justified or not. Now, the Tory voters know that the autumn statement was just about as socialist or even communist as you could get. And maybe many Tory MPs also realise that. As I've said before, it wrecks ambition, entrepreneurship and productivity. And on top of that, we're still on course for an inflation-boosting fuel duty increase of 12p a litre in April. Or is Hunt going to declare that it will once again be frozen just before the May local elections next year in the hope of staving off, perhaps, a total electoral wipeout? But all it would do is remind us all of how much pain is being imposed upon us in order to balance the books for building back better to the Great Reset. But despite all this criticism and backbench unrest, will Tory MPs do anything other than continue to support Sunak? And can they really hang on in the face of a recession until the next general election is due in a couple of years' time, with the latest date it can be held being January the 28th, 2025? And now we'll have a talk about the cost of living crisis. So take it away, Richard. Thank you, Jeff, and good evening. I am reading more and more reports of pensioners who are facing starvation and a winter without heating, as the system that they paid into their entire lives now leaves them to fend for themselves. But not to worry. Our unelected billionaire prime minister and his multi-millionaire chancellor both have very difficult decisions to make and the less well-off will be more than happy to shoulder the burden of these difficult decisions. However, I don't think that Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt will have to make decisions as difficult as if they can afford to eat today, or if they can afford to put the heating on today. No, no such decisions will be required for them, and the Prime Minister will, unfortunately, be facing an annual bill of £13,000 to heat his new £400,000 swimming pool. Perhaps we should have a whip round for him. Dig deep, chaps. Come on. And I wonder if there is any incentive left to pay into a system that now lets you freeze to death and starve to death with substandard national health care as your safety net. Let's face it, the state has only gone and broken its social contract with the people. Okay, but at least the state does protect us from any invasive force landing upon our shores, doesn't it? Oh, wait, no. Okay, well, at least the state isn't overbearing and would never mandate medical procedures in order to partake in society. No, they'd never do that, would they? <laughs> and the system certainly would never shut down society and coerce people into any medical mandate so they can go about their daily lives. Oh, for goodness sake. The state would never be that overbearing. And at least our, our streets are safe to walk at night, especially in the UK's capital. Yes, as I wander safely through the streets of London, listening to cockney rhyming slang and cockney knees-up music coming from every tavern, I know and I feel safe and secure in the knowledge that the state is doing all it can to preserve the British culture. Yes, the state has earned its right to exist, and we must all trust it and ignore all those ridiculous conspiracy theorists who would tell you that the state is there to serve a very different function, such as uh, protecting the elite and keeping the sheeple dumbed down just enough to prevent them from rising up. Thank you, King Charles, and for the state that you legitimize, we are all very happy. Back over to you, Jeff. Thank you, Richard. 
And finally, when subscribing, please don't forget to press that little bell and also select the All option, or you won't get any notifications when I publish a new video. And thank you all so much for taking the time to watch the show.